Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. Our Bible teacher will be Gunther von Haringa Sr. So without further ado, let's look into God's Word, the Bible. Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. This is going to be Psalm 110, Part 29, uh, Part B. And this was originally aired on October 26, 2014. I'll go ahead and start by reading Psalm 110. A Psalm of David, Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jehovah shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Jehovah hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. And at the close of our last study, we were looking at uh, Jeremiah 27. And that was a passage which had to do with the end of the God's usage of the nation of Israel, typifying the churches and denomination. And we saw where God used Nebuchadnezzar and in fact called him his servant, God's servant, because, and he does this frequently as, as we've seen throughout the Bible and in particular in the book of Judges where he'll use a heathen nation to bring judgment against Israel. Uh, and of course, Israel typifies the churches and denominations uh, of our present uh, time. And when we when we read this, it, it again confirms that you know what we what we have known in Matthew twenty four fifteen and Daniel eleven thirty one and Daniel twelve eleven regarding the abomination of desolation. And this began on May 21, 1988, when God commanded his people to leave the churches and denominations because God had begun his judgment program at the house of God, uh, at the churches and denominations. And what he did was to hand them over, lock, stock, and barrel to Satan. Uh, as we read in Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, 4, and then 12 through 17, and the fulfillment of that, which was in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and again, the king of Babylon, uh, typified by... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was literally the king of Babylon, uh, but he typifies Satan, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4, as I said, we find the fulfillment of this. Not because this is something that, that Satan conjured up. It's because of the fact that God allowed him uh, entrance into the, the temple. Uh, he put him there. God established him there. Uh, as the instead of Christ, as the one that was ruling, unbeknownst to those within the churches and denominations, that would be the last thing that would ever come into their mind. They're, they're thinking that they're going to worship God as believers had done for almost 2,000 years, unsuspecting that they were in the citadel of Satan. Let no man deceive you, by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed a son of perdition. And I should point out, <clears throat> excuse me, that this word, a falling away, is the Greek word apostasia, which is where we get our English word apostasy from who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And notice here that to sit is a figure of speech having to do with ruling, with reigning, and where is he reigning from? Where is the temple of God, if not in the churches and denominations? That, that's why we find this language, abomination of desolation, in the holy place. And there's only one holy place. It's the churches and denominations during the, the period of time known as the church age. Now, if we go to Nahum 3.1, we find an excellent illustration of the importance of key phrases found throughout the Bible. And um, I want to deviate a little bit here uh, be, because of the fact that um, when, when we, we find information like this, we, we want to be able to take a little detour because uh, I'd also like to point out some of the principles having to do with Bible study and also some of the um, tools that we use uh, with regard to Bible study. So I, I trust that this is going to be helpful even though this is a bit of a digression. Uh, let's uh, go back uh, to Nahum 3, and we find uh, this uh, uh, phrase in verse 1, Nahum 3, 1, Woe to the bloody city. Now, the, the first thing we want to do is to see if this exact phrase is repeated elsewhere in Scripture. And we can do this by means of a, a, a Bible software program, for example, or uh, if you're just using books by looking up the individual words with either of the following three study helps. Uh, one is the interlinear Bible. The best one is authored by J.P. Green Sr. And in the interlinear Bible, you have the uh, Greek and Hebrew letters of, of the words along with the Strong's number, which is very helpful. Uh, and this interlinear Bible is a great uh, resource because it enables the reader 
to see the word order in the original Greek and Hebrew, which is going to be different than English. For one thing, now Greek is the same as far as reading from left to right, but Hebrew is read from right to left. Uh, the second book is Englishman's Greek or Hebrew Concordance. Uh, again, a very uh, wonderful tool. Uh, it's actually indispensable in a lot of ways, but it shows the reader at a glance all of the different ways that a particular Greek or Hebrew word is translated in English. And this uh, enables the reader to understand the various nuances or connotations that these Hebrew and Greek words represent. Uh, I like to use the phrase, they're pregnant with meaning. Uh, Greek is a very precise language, whereas Hebrew is, is uh, much more expressive. Uh, nonetheless, these are the languages that God very particularly decided to use uh, as he wrote the Bible. Uh, number three is Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And this tool allows the reader to find the Strong's number for any English word in the authorized or King James uh, Bible. And it also provides synonyms uh, similar to the Englishman's for each Greek and Hebrew word. But unlike the Englishman's, it takes much longer to access the same information. And I do want to offer a word of caution because in the back of the Strong's there are definitions uh, for various words. And these are not necessarily reliable as they're only the opinions of Dr. Strong and or they're simply how the uh, the grammatical usage of a particular word uh, is defined. Instead of the spiritual meaning that God has hidden in each of the 14,565 unique Hebrew and Greek words that he penned. And we know that in order to find the spiritual definition, we have to compare Scripture with Scripture as we read in 1 Corinthians 2.13, because this is how God tells us to study the Bible. All right, well, let's go back to our phrase, uh, our, our illustration, woe to the bloody city. This is found in Nahum 3.1. The exact phrase also appears in Ezekiel 24.6, and also in Ezekiel 24, 9. Uh, furthermore, uh, when one looks up each of these words in, in all three passages, one discovers that all the Strong's numbers match, except for the woe in Nahum 3, 1, which is slightly different, the difference of one letter, as a matter of fact, but it embodies the same idea. Each phrase is comprised of the same three Hebrew words, woe to the bloody and city. Woe uh, in Nahum 3.1 is 1945. Uh, to the bloody is 1818 and city is 5892. Like I said, woe here in Nahum 3.1 is slightly different. It's a related word though. Uh, it's only off by one uh, letter. Uh, in Ezekiel 24.6, woe is one, <clears throat> excuse me, 188, to the bloody is again 1818, and city is 5892. Uh, also in verse 9 of Ezekiel 24, woe is 188, to the bloody is 1818, and city is 5892. Now earlier uh, I stated that Nineveh or Babylon is a representation or type of the churches and denominations of our day. But how can we prove this from the Bible? In order to come up with an answer that is biblical and does not contradict anything else in the Bible, we have to investigate 
the context of Ezekiel 24 as we did with Nahum 3 earlier to try to find some clues. We read in Ezekiel 24, 1 to 24, the following. Again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, write thee the name of the day, even of this same day. The king of Babylon, remember he typifies Satan, set himself against Jerusalem this same day and utter a parable unto the rebellious house, which is Jerusalem, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Set on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. Gather the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with the choice bones. Take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones under it and make it boil well and let them seethe the bones of it therein. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein and whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece. Let no lot fall upon it. For her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust, that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city! I will even make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty upon the coals thereof, that the brass of it may be hot and may burn, and that the filthiness of of it may be molten in it, that the scum of it may be consumed. She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire. In thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more, till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. I, the Lord, I, Jehovah, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent, according to thy ways and according to thy doings. Shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. Also the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thine head upon thee and put on thy shoes upon thy feet. And cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us, that thou doest so? Then I answered them. The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Speak unto the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, 
the desire of your eyes and that which your soul pitieth. And your sons and your daughters whom ye have left shall fall by the sword. And ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. And your tire shall be upon your heads, and your shoes upon your feet. Ye shall not mourn nor weep, but ye shall pine away for your iniquities, and mourn one toward another. And thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. According to all that he hath done, shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. In Nahum 3, we noted that the bloody city is called Nineveh and a harlot. And if one were to search out the numerous places where this word harlot is found, one would find corroboration that this is indeed a representation of the churches and denominations of our day. And as a result of the adultery or idolatry for which God divorced himself from national Israel, which took effect when Christ hung on the cross in 33 AD in the demonstration of what had taken place prior to creation. In Ezekiel 24, she is also identified as Jerusalem and as the bloody city twice. Additionally, God commands Ezekiel to tell the house of Israel specifically that he would profane or make unholy my sanctuary, his sanctuary. Furthermore, God sets up a historical parable in front of their very eyes by informing Ezekiel that his beloved wife would die and that he was to do the following in verses 16 through 18. Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shalt thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and in even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. Essentially, God is picturing his relationship with national Israel, which was a marriage relationship. And in this marriage relationship, God had laid down some important laws in the Bible. And one of the laws is that if a wife committed adultery, that she was to be stoned to death. Spiritually, adultery has to do with idolatry. And this is what national Israel fell into time and time again. Now, how is God going to enforce the law that the wife is to be stoned to death under the circumstances. It would mean that he would have to kill every single person in the nation of Israel. And this would be problematic because of the fact that, number one, the Messiah had to come through the nation of Israel. Number two, you had the elect that also were to come through the nation of Israel, the elect Israelites. And so by killing all the nation, this would prevent these two things from happening. And so God decided that he would adopt a temporary law in Deuteronomy 24.1, which gave him the, the ability, which, which uh, enabled him to 
uh, use that temporary law to divorce himself from national Israel, even though God hates divorce, and God in nowhere sanctions divorce, except in this very limited um, time frame in order for him not to have to kill everybody in the nation. And so he instituted this temporary law, giving him permission to divorce his wife, to divorce himself from national Israel. The divorce went into place or went into effect when Christ hung on the cross. Because at that point, if you recall, the veil of the temple was ripped in half from top to bottom, as if by the finger of God, uh, showing or revealing the holy place, which was never to be open to the public at all. It was only for the high priest to go in once a year with special garments and uh, blood and incense. And this was where God's presence was to be found. And uh, it was a very, very holy and solemn uh, occasion when this took place. Um, but this was now wide open. So that meant that, number one, the temple was no longer holy, Jerusalem as the city was no longer holy, and the people of God, uh, the Israelites themselves, were no longer considered holy people apart from the elect who would come out of national Israel. And so in the uh, example that God sets up, he's setting up a historical parable with Ezekiel and his wife, Ezekiel representing God and his wife representing the nation of Israel. His wife dies and Ezekiel is told I don't, by God, I don't want you to mourn. I don't want you to carry on, uh, you know, crying and, and mourning for your wife. Um, this, is, this is not because uh, literally he wasn't supposed to do this. Uh, uh, and uh, that wasn't the idea. The idea is because she pictures this divorce, okay, that is taking place. What God is saying is, I don't want you to mourn for this divorce that I have instituted, that, that I have put into place, because this is my decision. This is what I have decided to do. And so you are to accept it, and you're not to cry or lament over it, because this is my will. And so that's the idea behind this a historical situation that God set up right in front of the eyes of the nation of Israel because they saw this. They saw his wife die. They saw the reaction, the, the obedient reaction of Ezekiel regarding this idea to his wife. And in so doing, God is giving a living, breathing example to the nation of what he expects having to do with this divorce. Okay, well, uh, we're going to have to stop here today, and Lord willing, we will continue again when we uh, get to our next study uh, here in Psalm 110. Thank you for joining us today for Searching the Scriptures. Until next time, to God be the glory.